Moderator John Ferguson, uh, 301. Moderator, the issue of assisted dying is now dominating our news cycle. It's being debated formally and informally across the country. And the issue provokes strong feelings and passionate debate, with polling showing that a majority of the public in the UK are in favour of it being made legal, including those who claim religious adherence. And this is in contrast to the vast majority of Christian denominations and other faith groups in which there is consistent strong opposition to the legislation of assisted dying, to the legalisation, I should say, of assisted dying. Legislation is pending in both the Westminster and Holyrood parliaments, and it's possible that the Isle of Man or Jersey could become the first part of the British Isles to legalise assisted dying. Assisted dying, or as some people prefer to term it, assisted suicide, is legal in a number of European countries with legislation going before the French Parliament later this month. And in Spain, it's recognised as a constitutional right. Canada has medical assistance in dying or made, and assisted dying is legal in 11 of the 50 states in the United States. The presenter, Esther Ranson, has stage four cancer, and she has spoken out strongly in favor of assisted dying, and has indicated that she would take up the opportunity to go to Dignitas in Switzerland, should she reach that stage. In contrast, the actor and disability rights campaigner, Liz Carr, has recently made a very powerful documentary, which some of you may have seen, called Better Off Dead, which presents the arguments against assisted dying. Liz is disabled, and the title of the documentary was based on a remark that she's heard people say to her on many occasions. Gosh, if I was like you, I couldn't go on. I'd rather be dead. Along with many other disabled people, she is strongly opposed to assisted dying and fearful of what it might be might mean for those who are disabled. There's also a number of high-profile cases in which people who were terminally ill have tested the law in the UK. These include Diane Perry, who had motor neuron disease and asked the UK government to guarantee that her husband would not be prosecuted if he helped her to die, and she lost her case. One thing to mention, moderator, is that it's obviously very important in this debate to keep in mind what the various terms involved actually mean, although it has to be said that some of the definitions are strongly disputed. Assisted dying is generally used to describe a situation where a terminally ill person seeks medical help to obtain lethal drugs which they self-administer. Assisted suicide can be intentionally helping another person to end their life and may not involve someone who is terminally ill. But others would argue that the terms are interchangeable. Euthanasia is the act of deliberately ending a person's life to relieve suffering in which the, legal, the lethal drug is administered by doctors. And this is divided into voluntary and involuntary depending on whether the person gives their consent or not. Moderator, as our interim report makes clear, we're now halfway through our work and we'll bring a full report to the General Assembly of 2025. And by that time, the legislative process in the UK parliaments will clearly have moved on. So at this stage, we're simply reporting to the Assembly on the progress we've made and on the work that we plan to do over the coming year. And this is in no way to suggest that we're seeking to prevent debate on this issue at the Assembly just now, but we're saying that it may well be better for the Assembly to fully debate this issue when we have completed our work. The Church of Scotland has always opposed assisted dying, and the response from the former Faith Impact Forum in December 2021 to the Liam MacArthur Bill presently going through the Scottish Parliament was very clear. 
It stated that the church was fully opposed to the bill and said that the legislation was not required because it was argued that in the vast majority of cases, properly delivered palliative care can effectively address the suffering of a terminally ill person. And it also called for the title of the bill to be changed to assisted suicide. Any future response from the Public Life and Social Justice Committee of FAPO to the next stages of the bill as it progresses through Parliament would, we assume, take into account the work of our group. But there was undoubtedly a shift at the Assembly last year when a debate took place which didn't fully reflect the strong opposition to assisted dying outlined in the report by the Faith Impact Forum. It was a very dignified debate in which some commissioners shared some very moving personal stories, many of them speaking in favour of assisted dying. And the Assembly went on to recognise that there exists a range of theological and ethical opinions on this subject and asked that these views and opinions be explored. And this is what we've been doing. This was clearly a recognition on the part of the Assembly last year that the ground has shifted in society and the church when it comes to opposition to assisted dying. As our report makes clear we intend to continue our listening exercise by meeting with experts in palliative care and others in the medical profession, healthcare and hospice chaplains, cross-reach and other care providers, and with representatives from other denominations. And we'll also endeavour to provide space to presbyteries to allow them to explore this issue. And we already have a day conference uh, for one presbytery in the diary. We will reflect more on the practical issues that could face the church and its ministers should assisted dying be made legal in Scotland? How might it affect pastoral care in situations where a church member is considering assisted dying? Should this choice be reflected in funeral liturgies? How might it affect staff working in crossreach? We'll explore the deep concerns that people have about what they see as the risks of legalizing assisted dying and the importance of safeguards. And we'll continue to wrestle with the moral and theological principles that undergird a range of views on this topic. These include areas such as the sovereignty of God, that our personal autonomy should not extend to deciding when we can end our own life, a position opposed by others who argue that we already intervene by prolonging life medically. It includes areas such as the theological tradition that valorizes physical suffering as a spiritual practice to share in the sufferings of Jesus. But others would oppose any suggestion that God wishes us to suffer. And some Christians may see assisted dying as diminishing the sanctity of life as given to us by God, and will point to biblical examples to back this up, such as the biblical concept of the image of God. Others will argue that there are no biblical or theological reasons to be against ending someone's suffering and offering them a dignified death. In all of this, we are very much aware that there are many strong views on either side, and that this is a very complex issue. And so what we're seeking to do is to assist and resource the church going forward. We want to listen to the church, but more than anything, we want to help church members listen to one another with respect as we deal with this complex, controversial, and important issue. Moderator, I therefore present the report and move the deliverance. Thank you. Is that seconded? Seconded. Thank you. Um, we have uh, two questions on our screen. We'll start with these two questions before we receive the report. I'm going to ask Jessica Linda and then Brian Kerr to bring their questions. Jessica, please.
which your light comes on. Up on the balcony, thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, Jessica Lindy, 551. Um, in light of the fact that the working group was instructed by the General Assembly to pull together this report in response to the proposed bill to legalize uh, assisted dying here in Scotland, I don't think we can ignore what has been happening since legalizing uh, assisted dying in Canada. The story of Canada legalizing assisted dying starting off with a bill much like the one here propo proposed in Scotland uh, included a scope, was the scope limited to those who uh, had terminal diagnoses? Jessica, I don't want to uh, hold your con but if that's a comment rather than the question. I'm I leading to a question. I'm well, I if you could get to the question quicker and then you can welcome bring the other bit as a comment. I see. Thank you. In light of um, the proposed bill in Scotland potentially coming to a point like it has in Canada now where the scope is increased to potentially include those with mental health, severe mental health, will for safeguarding concerns for all residents of Scotland, will the working group be considering potentially different theological pers perspectives based on diagnosis so that we can prevent people wishing to end their life who might not be able to access proper mental health support just because that type of support is often very limited. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Thank you, moderator, for the question. Uh, in terms of Canada, there are basically um, two tracks in Canada. Um, the first track requires that natural death is reasonably foreseeable, and the second track, which takes longer to assess, is that natural death is not reasonably foreseeable. And my understanding is that disabled people in Canada sued the government to allow disabled people to be included in this. And uh, in terms of um, mental health, my understanding, again, is that in Canada, a decision was made recently that giving people with mental health conditions access to MAID has now been delayed until 2027. Uh, but we certainly will um, look into this because Canada does provide many um, aspects in regard to assisted dying that will be very helpful for us to, to explore further. So we're very happy um, to look into this um, further, moderator. Thanks very much. A uh, question from Brian Kerr. Care 227. Moderator, thank you. I read in the report about the variety of beliefs or the, the standpoints that people have. And I also heard the convener say that, you know, things even in the last year have moved on significantly um, legis legislation wise. Assuming that the legislation is likely to cover the safeguards and the, the things that, that will be in place, I wonder if the convener could give um, further kind of comment on how the report might be shaping up in terms of uh, the theological standpoint, whether it's going to be looking at these safeguards or whether the church feel there need to be different safeguards put in place, um, given that this is now on, on the legislative agenda. Thank you. Uh, moderator, we have uh, made clear that we will be exploring a range of theological views, and so I think that would very much come into it. And we will, of course, um, be thinking very carefully about all of the safeguarding aspects. And indeed, we will be um, exploring that when we continue our, our consultations. One thing that we're doing in September is to meet with Liam MacArthur um, to discuss uh, his bill. And so obviously safeguards will be uh, on the agenda. I have three more questions, which I'll take before we receive the interim report. Four more questions. Sean Swindell and then Derek Browning. Can I just ask the gentleman in the corner over on my right? Where are you recording then, sir? Uh, well, there's, there's places in the, in, the, in the hall where people may not wish to actually be photographed. So please, can I ask the Assembly to ensure that you know where people are seating so that they, they, those, there are some that will not be recorded. So always please just check with the top table where that could happen. And I ask everybody not to take photographs 
or to record a meeting of this court of the church. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, Sean Swindell. Moderator 374, Sean Swindells. Um, this is an issue probably slightly out of the theological perspective, but I think we're all aware of the increasing pressures on the National Health Service. Um, if the worst reports are to believe the health service is almost virtually on its knees, and this must have great concerns for the future provision of health care for those who are unable to go private. And I just wondered if the convener could advise if this is going to be part of the consideration for the final version of the report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to say Derek Browning, then Scott Burton, then Ben Thorpe. And then at that point, I think we're going to move forward because this is an interim report and we, we want to make sure we do it. Dr. Browning. Pardon? Sorry? Oh, sorry, I apologise. Yes, moderator, on, on the NHS, we, we, we're in complete agreement um, with what uh, Mr. Sundells has said. Um, there's, no, there's no question. We completely agree with you on that, Sean. I apologise, Sean. Dr. Brand. Thank you, moderator. Um, at 3.2 in the report, the um, convener alludes to the fact that materials will be produced. Um, given that the assembly report will have to be in some sort of written format, probably by sort of February, March of next year, the window for materials to be produced and then sent out to presbyteries, Kirk Sessions and other bodies is, is quite small. And I wonder if the convener could give some indication as to when the materials will appear. Um, I know, for example, my own presbytery um, is thinking about holding an event um, around this um, topic uh, and would appreciate having the materials in the hands of presbyters and indeed Kirk Sessions as soon as is humanly possible. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Um, as I said, the plan, the plan is that we hope to hold um, conference sessions with presbyteries over the coming year and obviously we'll have material um, relating to that but I think we then want to produce further material that will emerge out of our report so in terms of further resources that will come um, actually probably after next year's assembly um, in terms of seeking to resource the church because we want these resources to to stem from um, what will probably be quite a substantial um, final report next year. Thank you. Uh, Scott Burton and then Ben Thorpe. Scott Burton, number 221. Thank you, moderator. A uh, question. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the, the group could explain why um, the, the term assisted dying has been chosen, uh, used rather than a, a broader or a range of terms, because that feels like it may be charting a particular path already. And so just asking for some clarity on that, although there was some explanation of the, the terms used, not why that particular one already was used. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. It really emerged, uh, moderator, because of the fact that this um, deliverance actually came out of uh, an earlier deliverance that was actually rejected by the Assembly, but nevertheless it came out of um, the bill. Um, and the title of the bill is Assisted Dying. And so that's why um, we've chosen to go um, for that term to, to reflect that. Thank you. And I'll take as the last question, just now the questions are always in order, Ben Thorpe. Uh, thank you, moderator. Ben Thorpe, 181. Um, you mentioned, obviously, the things that have been happening in Canada. Um, it appears, uh, from what I can tell, around the world, Netherlands, Belgium, uh, the state of Oregon, other places that have implemented such bills have always found themselves um, facing legal challenges that, that have then led to the increase in scope. As we are responding to particularly the situation in Scotland, will you also be addressing the situation in terms of if Scotland then chooses to increase its scope, um, will we just have a blanket response or will you be offering differing responses or a particular response to the bill as it currently stands? Moderator, I think it would be very difficult for us to anticipate that, anticipate um, what might happen in future years. You're absolutely right that 
in relation to Canada, there have been changes in legislation and the legislation has, has expanded the criteria. But I don't really think we can commit to um, responding to that at this stage. I think we simply have to, at this point, respond to the bill um, as, as it will stand um, when it's presented to, to the Holyrood Parliament. Thank you very much. Let me try and tell you where we are, Assembly, at this stage. I'm going to ask if you're willing to receive the interim joint report, whereas I have one general comment at that point, David Kavanagh. Just to say, when we come on to point two, I've already got 10 names on the screen of people who want to speak. It is now 20 to six coming up, and you have done very well. So I'm going to ask if the 10 people who are, I won't necessarily call you all, if those who I do call could be brief, bearing in mind two things. One, we've worked very hard today, and secondly, this is an interim report, and we'll be making decisions next year rather than this year. I'm not trying to curtail the assembly. I'm trying to keep you alive and well for tomorrow. <laughs> Um, section one, receive the interim joint report. Is that agreed? And online. Thank you. Uh, and then I'm going to call on David Kavanagh, who wanted to make a general comment at this point. David? David Kavanagh, 478, um, representing the Salvation Army. It is a great privilege to be here. It is, I think, my third General Assembly in person, and I always greatly enjoy it and I am very grateful for permission to speak when there are so many people waiting to speak. I am of course a brother in Christ but I also recognize that I am an outsider and I do not wish in any way to comment in a way that could conceivably influence the General Assembly. I would actually have wished to comment almost earlier and I really just want to say that I read this section of the report book and the preceding section, the report of the Theological Forum, with particular interest because I am a member of what the Salvation Army calls the Moral and Social Issues Council. I think it's fairly clear what that body does. Um, it does what it says on the tin. It addresses questions very similar to those that have been addressed by the Theological Forum and the Assisted Dying um, discussion. We are, in fact, at the moment discussing pastoral guidelines on transgender people in the church, and I will be signalling the report of the Theological Forum to the chair of the Moral and Social Issues Council, and I prophetically expect to similarly signal the final report on assisted dying to the same chairman of the same body next year. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your gracious words. Just to say, we're very happy for you to influence our General Assembly. That's why we have visitors here. So uh, don't, don't hold back, especially if you think we're completely off the wall. Um, that's Aramaic. Um, we move to section two. I'm going to take two questions first and then try and get a, a representative of different people who have views on this matter. Let me just take Francis Heathfield and Jeff Berry, who both have questions to ask. Francis, if you come first and then Jeff, be ready to speak. Francis is looking for a microphone that will go red. Yep, you're there. Um, thank you, moderator. Francis Hayfield, number 76. Um, this is perhaps a question because I am a grumpy ex-English teacher. Um, in the next steps, it says create space in presbyteries. I'm not terribly keen on jargon. What does that actually mean? And secondly, uh, adding the phrase, uh, if presbyteries wish, seemed to me on such an important issue to be a bit dismissive. Would you agree? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. Um, sorry about the jargon. Um, bas basically, giving space is to... We're looking at really at two options, either to um, ask a presbyter to hold um, like a, a special meeting, a, a conference event, 
um, to, talk, to talk about this issue, or um, not such a good option in many ways, but to allow us um, a slot at an ordinary meeting. Um, so that's basically what we're looking for. Um, and I, I put the invitation out um, to, my, to my fellow Presbytery clerks, um, and I'm very much hoping that we will be able to um, engage with all the presbyteries. I, I, we didn't really think it was appropriate. I don't think it would be appropriate for us to um, ask the Assembly to instruct presbyteries to do this. Um, I, I would prefer that we simply um, are inviting them um, to take part uh, in the hope that um, they will all engage. So um, I, I would resist um, instructing presbyteries to engage. Thank you for your question, Francis. I wonder how you would mark his homework. Um, <laughs> Jeff. Um, can I just say, I would say, if they wish... Moderator, if, if yeah. Ms. Hayford could move to a microphone. Yeah, that you can only speak at a microphone. And, and I think, actually, I think, we, I think we'll leave that. Uh, if you just leave that just now, we'll have other people to speak. Okay. Okay, thank you. Moderator, Jeff Berry, 53. I wish. Um, <laughs> a fairly serious note... There's a huge difference between assisted dying and withholding medical care for someone who is terminally ill, uh, probably in their last hours. Would it be within the remit of the committee to produce something, perhaps on a theological ground, to be shared for pastoral support to those family members who have had to make that harrowing decision to turn off the machines? Is that within your remit? Is it something, is it something that you'd consider doing for the wider church as a resource? Thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's not... Um, Is this you know, a point, to the point of order? Well, can you go to a microphone, please? Give us your name and number, please. 424 Mary Stobo. Moderator, there are several of us, not just oldies like me, are having great difficulty in hearing what's being said. Can we ask that something is done about this, please? Because these are important matters that we really want to hear what's being said by everyone. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. Uh, uh, moderator, if I, can, if I may respond, because I'm the one doing the sound in the assembly. Hello, everyone. Um, it's most helpful if you speak really close to the microphone. I appreciate some positions might be difficult because you're on the slope. So if you find a microphone that's more adjusted to your height, that would be most helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. That is not specifically in our remit, um, it has to be said, but it is something that we are very keen to do, and I think it's something that is very much needed um, for the church. And so although it's not in our remit, I would hope that we can still address it. I wouldn't have thought that anybody would have any objections to us doing so, um, because I think what you're suggesting is absolutely vital um, for, for people experiencing um, this in terms of pastoral care and all that, that families go through in these situations. Thank you for that. We now move to some comments. And again, can we ask for the sake of the time to keep them brief? And if other people are speaking the same issue in the comments been made, Perhaps we don't need to hear it a second time this evening. Let me call Lindsay Sanderson first and then Stanley Okeke. Uh, Lindsay Sanderson, 486. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome the report and thank uh, the group for their work, in particular in relation to their invitation to work with members of other denominations in the ongoing work many of us in, as partner churches uh, with the Church of Scotland uh, have benefited greatly from opportunities to um, collaborate on significant pieces of work. And I believe that this is one such where by sharing insights together, we all learn because the range of opinion that is evident from in the Church of Scotland uh, from the work thus far is also present in other churches too. I believe this is also an important way in which we can build together as we address important issues in our public life. So thank you for that uh, intention to collaborate with others. Thank you very much. Stanley?
Thank you, moderator, for letting me speak again. Um, moderator, on Saturday, the immediate past moderator said something about the mustard plant, that when you let it grow, it causes havoc and destroys a lot of things. Moderator, the church has found itself in an awkward position in the contemporary time. It is not our making. Growing up, I was taught in the Catechism that we are fighting against sin, the world, and the devil. But in the contemporary time, we are also fighting against scientific discovery, moderator. Um, I would say we have been given a legacy to protect and to pass on to generations that follows. And if we water it down and not pass these legacies on as handed to us, we will have questions to answer. We understand the position of the scriptures when it comes to issues of life and death. God is not yet tired in controlling the affairs of human, and he is not asking us to assist him to stop life. God is still God. We have to be very, very careful, moderator, because no matter how we try to play along with policies of the state, we are still the church of Jesus Christ. And the Bible is, our, is the book of our moral, faith, and other. And we have to heed to the instructions of the scriptures. God is the creator of life. God has invited us to support those who are suffering. God has invited us to comfort those who are suffering. He has not called us, called us as a church to become voice to taking life. And we should not become voice speaking for those who want to find the background, the, the, the platform to stand against the word of God, moderator. I'm saying this because I may not be here in the assembly next year to speak about this, but I want us to stop this mustard seed spreading before it causes havoc to us all as the Church of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. I'm going to call an elder, Susan Pym, and then someone from overseas, Sharon Hollis. And then we'll take stock where we're at. Susan Pym, number 468. I'm an elder at St. Columbus in London. Moderator, thank you. I also thank the current working group for the work they have carried on thus far. However, I want to ensure that certain voices are heard going forward. The voices of people who understand palliative care and of those who have witnessed a very difficult rather than a peaceful death. Every Thursday, you will find me volunteering at a hospice in North London, where I welcome new patients and I look after all the visiting family and friends. The hospice is the most beautiful, wonderful place I know, a place full of love, of palliative care, where the staff ensure that each individual has the best of life at the end of life. For three years, I helped to care for my younger sister, who was treated at that very hospice, and who chose to return there for her final days. My sister suffered from a thankfully rare but horrendous neurological disease, which in the end left her with nothing. Her entire body atrophied. She could not swallow or speak properly, she suffered from terrible muscle spasms, and she could not move. Her chaplain at that time is here today, and he bears witness to her immense suffering. During her final months, she asked me on three occasions to fetch her some bleach, thinking that drinking it would end her misery. I couldn't do it. In her final hours, I admit I contemplated 
how I might help her end her suffering. I couldn't do it. The last words I heard her barely whispering were, help me, help me. But no one could. You see, at 56, her heart was still strong. I wish I could say she died peacefully, but in reality, she didn't. Although the staff did all, all that was available to them. I'm sure I suffered from PTSD afterwards. The night before my sister's funeral on the 23rd of December, 2021, our wee family dog, our pet of 17 years, who had been ill for a long time, was put to sleep by our very caring vet. In 30 seconds, our beloved wee Robbie, my sister's best friend in the entire world, gently, peacefully slipped away with dignity and somewhere along the way he joined her. Dear God, why could we not do the same for her? I don't believe that our God wanted her to suffer so much. If you have walked in my shoes, then I know that you will empathize with my plea for the church to support considering and supporting regularly regulated assisted dying. If you haven't walked in my shoes, then honestly, I pray that you never have to. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Hollis, uh, 493. Uh, I come from the Uniting Church in Australia. Over the last eight years, voluntary assisted dying has been progressively been legalised in different states in Australia. And as a church, we have had to respond, mostly uh, post the passing of legislation. We find ourselves in much sympathy and solidarity with the tender and important work that you're doing. I just want to make a couple of observations from um, our experience, and I want to make a personal observation about language. So it's called voluntary assisted dying in Australia. It has to be voluntary. The assisted is obviously the provision of medication um, to help people to die. Uh, Australian legislation is fairly tight. It's considered some of the most uh, stringent in terms of requirements to uh, get access to the legislation. A couple of observations. We have numbers of communities in Australia who uh, come from refugee situations where they have been the victims of state violence and state interference in their life. And we found that having conversations with those communities required very, very, very careful work. Uh, because when you start to talk about legislation around dying and where the government has persecuted you, that can be very difficult. But through very careful work, they have come on the journey uh, with the community and are now, like the rest of the church, uh, in the range of positions you have outlined. Members of the Uniting Church hold the, the very range of positions that you have indicated in your report. And for us, the positive thing about d discussing it and having a position is people feel they can have the conversation, the pastoral conversations they need to have. If a family member dies using voluntary assisted dying, they feel they can come to the church for a funeral and that that will be respected and honoured in the liturgy. We've also developed liturgical resources for people who uh, re withdraw medical treatment uh, as per the previous speaker. Uh, it's been a positive experience for us to have this conversation and so I just am grateful that I've been able to make a comment this year because I won't be here next year to offer you our encouragement um, and our solidarity, it is, it is a vital conversation to have. I also want to make a personal note about language, and it goes to do with the language about suicide. My partner died by suicide. It is an incredibly um, difficult thing to talk about, and I have never felt more marginalised in my life than when I have had to admit that. So I understand that that is a decision that causes many people distress. The fact that I'm saying that will cause some people to distress and I apologise. But I really want to urge us to find language in the debate about voluntary assisted dying that is very careful to draw distinctions between voluntary assisted dying and suicide and that the language we use does not impose judgement 
on families who live with the burden of a family member who has died by suicide. So as you take this journey, I also offer you um, that encouragement, the, the, the terminology, the language, the way we talk about all of these decisions is incredibly important pastorally, not just in the realm of voluntary assisted dying, but in the realm of mental health and those of us who live in the shadow of suicide. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you where we are, Assembly. I have four names still on the screen, which I may or may not call. After this, we still have one more report, which we hope will be brief, but knowing the Assembly, it might not be. I have to tell our chaplain you're being remaindered. Not as chaplain, but just as a report. So we've just got this one to do. Let's try and see. I'm going to ask each of the four people if there's anything that's not been said that could be said very quickly. Otherwise, we'll just move on straight to, to, to take the deliverance. This is an interim report. And, convener, I'll invite you then to make any response you make to any of the comments, if you so wish. So let me just take them first. Robert Mallinson. Yeah. Yeah. Mallinson, 309. I've heard a lot of talk about being a prophetic voice in the assembly. And if we look at that prophetic voice throughout Scripture, it was often resisting what society was saying is normal and okay. I have real concerns about this, that we're missing a window here by having this interim report and a further report coming next year. When legislation, because it will be passed, and I think we're all very aware of that, when it is passed, my concern is, where is the line drawn? Because it's okay saying we have checks and balances in place now, but as we know with many things, I wouldn't be surprised if those checks and balances have been pushed even further within a 10-year period. And, and I think that could cause real harm for individuals, for families. We, you know, we've talked about detransitioning as well around gender stuff. When somebody takes their life, there is no... D coming back to life. And I think we need to be very careful in our society about the line that could be crossed here. Thank you. <laughs> Alan Wright. You're on. Alan Wright, 463. Um, I will cut some of what I was going to say in, in terms of being brief. But I am the pioneer minister to the veterinary community um, and a practicing vet. And I thought it would be interesting and helpful for the assembly to hear how we justify not just assisted dying, but euthanasia, albeit in animals and not in people. The big difference between human medicine and veterinary medicine is that in veterinary, we do not prioritize longevity or sanctity of life, much as they are important, we prioritise welfare. It's not about living longer, but living life without continued pain and suffering. Some of the conditions that people are left at at the end of their life, were we to leave our patients in that condition, we would be struck off. And if owners were to leave their animals in those states, they would find themselves coming under prosecution by the RSPCA or in Scotland, the SSPCA. We are taught in veterinary school that death is not a welfare concern. It is an ethical concern, and that is why we have to discuss it. But a person or an animal cannot have welfare after they have died. That's the principle that veterinary medicine works on. If the welfare of an individual is significantly negative, with no hope of recovering, by allowing them to die peacefully and respectfully, we can actually improve their welfare by returning it to uh, zero. As vets, we joke sometimes about how easy being a doctor must be, you know exactly what species is coming through the door. <laughs> but the one thing that vets tell me they couldn't do in human medicine, the one thing that they say makes, means they could not be doctors, is the necessity, as they see it, to let their patients suffer. And that is something that, as vets, we will not do. Yep. 
I'm going to call on Irene Monroe and then Julia Pazuto Fomako as our last two people, if they have additional things to say. Irene? Thank you, moderator. Irene Munro, 418, just wanted to urge the working party to think more medically as well as theologically, because I think we don't, can't divide ourselves like that, and I think that we need to look into that, and just to draw attention to the fact that in Oregon, um, they did a survey and found 50% of those who um, wanted assisted suicide or assisted dying uh, did it because they felt a burden on other people. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, Julia. Moderator, uh, Julia Pizzuto Pamako, 370 over here. Sorry. Thank you so much right. for allowing me to speak. I know that it is the end of the day. I know we are tired. I am ready to go home as well. But I would ask that you would have attention for this very important issue. I want to thank the Theological Committee for doing the hard work, for asking important questions. And I would ask you as you go forward in the next year that there are many, many stories out there. We are a broad church, and um, I would caution us as we take a view that may be different than the traditional. I speak as someone who's been through this. My husband um, died uh, a year and a half ago of MND. I came to this country, um, connected before, but um, he had, um, we'd been here four months when he was diagnosed. So um, I have been in ministry for 25 years. I have been a theologian and taught in seminary and other places. I experience this very differently. So involve people in theological discourse that have the experience as well, because it is not just, and I know you know this, but be very intentional. It's not just an academic exercise. I would encourage the people that are here to take the time to listen to people's conversation. While we heard many stories that were eloquent about um, how hard death can be. I could tell you stories of how hard death and the grief afterwards and the PTSD with older children. My son John is here. He was hopeful that one of us would be able to speak because it was a journey for us. It's still a journey for us. And my concern is that we would listen to the value in suffering as well. Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There have been times I have cried that. There are times my husband cried that while he could barely, you know, get out of bed or raise his hand or was only texting or drooling. This was a 55-year-old man struck down in his prime. It happens. We know that there is hard, hard situations, but there was value in it. And I'm not saying that everybody can go there. What we're going to find is that some people may not go there, whether it's the withdrawal of medical you know, um, provision. That's one way. We, and we did ask that you look at the difference between that and voluntary assisted suicide, or voluntary assisted dying, excuse me for the wrong word. Um, but even when we talk about suicide, there's, there's struggles in it all. And we need to be pastorally aware of that. So please, as we prepare this, as we think about it, I know we're all in a hurry, but I would commend you to do reading, to talk to people you know, and to share your thoughts with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Now, other people have asked to speak, but I've decided that's the end, so I'm going to ask the convener to comment, and then we'll take uh, this deliverance. Moderator, I'll be very brief. We weren't really sure as a group what kind of debate we would have, um, given this is an interim report. But I have to say this has been an incredibly helpful debate for a group that is halfway through its work. And I'd just like to thank everybody who contributed. Some of the contributions have been very powerful and very moving. Everybody has been really helpful, and we'll take it all um, on board uh, as we move forward. Just to mention, for those who might be interested in relation to this, um, Susan mentioned uh, palliative care, and there is a briefing, if people want to look at it, from Marie Curie, which um, indicates that palliative care need in Scotland is projected to increase by up to 20% by 2040. By 2040, up to 95% of all people who die may need a palliative care approach in Scotland. And Marie Curie um, is calling for some very significant measures to increase support for those requiring such care. If I could also just pick up on um, Mr. Mallison's point about the legislation that it's going to be passed. 
Um, I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, basically, nobody knows um, if it's going to be passed or not. It's, it's not a known factor at the moment. And I would just encourage um, members of the Assembly and, and people in churches to engage with their MSPs. Whatever your view might be, um, there will be an opportunity to write to MSPs um, about the bill um, going forward. And I would encourage everybody um, who's, who cares about this subject to consider doing so. Thank you, moderator. Thank you very much. We now move to section two of the deliverance. Does the assembly approve? And online. And the interim report as a whole. Um, and online. Thank you. And can I just, before we move here, just to say my warmest appreciation to everyone in the assembly, both for being here and for the dignity and grace in which you've spoken, not just in this debate, but in a number of very sensitive debates today. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. I'm going to ask uh, our business convener who's going to tell us what's going to happen now. Moderator, if, if I might echo your comments about thanking people for their attendance through this, both here in the hall and online. I'm also very grateful to Mr Hamilton, who has indicated he's happy for his committee to be remainded. Um, so the re registration of ministries committee will be remainded to a further session of the Assembly. I will update the Assembly tomorrow morning as to when that will be. Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. It will be on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me invite you, if you're able, to stand and we'll close with the benediction. May the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the friendship of Jesus Christ the Son, and the joy of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with you all this day and always. Amen.